Welcome. My name is Michael Pearson. I'm a professor at Fordham University in New York, and I'm also the president of the International Humanistic Management Association. Today, in this short little video, I want to give an overview of the concept of dignity, human dignity, viewed from an evolutionary biology perspective. This is not a typical perspective when we talk about human dignity, and I'm hoping that by the end of this presentation, you will get access to the power of viewing human dignity through that biological lens. I will also present to you a way how we can integrate this biological evolutionary perspective with the ancient wisdom traditions in what the famous biologist calls the consilience of knowledge, so that we can see how dignity is actually a very encompassing foundational concept of how we can organize. So without further ado, I want to share with you just the basic setup that we, as you all know and see, we're witnessing manifold crises, whether it's the environment, whether it's trust in business, whether it's pollution, corruption, poverty, hunger, whether it's uh, populist movements that are revolting against something, the elites most of the time, and potentially emerging inequality that you see. We have these problems and we're not able to really grasp them, I would assert. And I will assert also that the conversation uh, around human dignity can provide a new perspective. Albert Einstein is credited with many smart contributions. And here I'm just referencing one bon mot, which is problems cannot be solved with the same mindset that created them. So in this context, the focus on dignity I think can provide us with a novel perspective. Another uh, quote that I'm referencing here is that uh, quote of William Allen, who was the Chancellor of Chancery, or the Court of Chancery in Delaware, where most of the companies in the United States and uh, the world are headquarters if they do business globally and in the United States. And what he mentioned in 1993 already is that one of the marks of a truly dominant intellectual paradigm is the difficulty people have in even imagining an alternative view. He was referencing the perspective of shareholder value maximiz maximization as the ultimate goal of an organization, specifically a business. And uh, I wanna uh, share with you that I, I think that this conversation has been influencing management at large, not just business. In that context, the uh, primary challenge I would assert is the challenge of how we view each other and ourselves as human beings. What is it, where, what is it, that we, that we think of ourselves, what is motivating us, what is inspiring us, where do we come from, who are we, and where do we go? Those are the basic existential questions. And the current foundation of organizing, uh, I will suggest, and this has been, this argument has been made in various other ways by other much more prominent uh, intellectual than myself, that the baseline of how we view ourselves and how we organize society is the view of Homo economicus. And I'm sure that many of you have heard of Homo economicus when you studied economics. And uh, that is a perspective that allows us to view humans as sharing something in common. And what we have in common is what uh, is and can be expressed here as, as uh, Scrooge McDuck um, greed. We want more, we want more money. Now, these background narratives are background narratives. They are not necessarily fully present in our day-to-day -day interactions. And 
what I'm suggesting here is that we all use metaphors, images, and experiences to, our, to understand ourselves and others, especially when we're organizing, when we're organizing for some kind of goal that is not only our goal, our personal goal. And these images do matter, even though we oftentimes are not fully present to them. I will also suggest that there are at least two background narratives that are currently at play. And the dominant one is the economistic story, that story of Homo economicus, that we're all in it for ourselves. We're utility maximizers. We want the most for ourselves. We're fundamentally amoral, asocial, not concerned with others. What matters is what's good for us. And somehow that is not connected with what's good for others or it is ignorant of that which is good of others. And that's the foundation of much of our management theory, of our organizing, of the organizations that we have put in place, including the corporation, and the education that supports it. <clears throat> of course, this is not the only story. There are many other stories, but for the sake of this presentation, I'm capturing one other story that has had quite some influence, but it's not the dominant one, I would argue, which is the humanistic story or the story of Homo sapiens, which is we're a little bit more complex. We're here to survive and thrive and flourish. Now, the economistic narrative, as I said, this is a textbook definition, and I'm assuming that many of you know about this. But just to put it out there again, this is the foundation of much of our current managerial theory and financial theory and economic theory, and therefore the organizations that we built around that theory, that we are rational, we are fully informed, we're utility maximizing, we have a fixed utility function, we're self-interested and amoral. We pursue opportunism with guile, as Nobel laureate Williamson formulated in 1979. Now, everybody, in that space, we'll say this is an approximation that is not fully true, but this is how we're going to assume for now how people operate. We have consequences for that operation. If we are structuring organizations and we assume that everybody's in it for themselves, well, then how can we actually make sense of that? How can we create something that works for everybody? It can only work if we have com command and control structures, because how, how else would you get utility maximizing individuals that are immoral to work together. It requires command and control. I am arguing that there is another way that we can make sense of what we have in common. And that is the pathway to understanding dignity. And in that context, the notion of homo sapiens is who we have become to be. We have origins in Australopithecus forms, Homo habilis, Homo erectus, and then ultimately we became the species that we call Homo sapiens or Homo sapiens sapiens, the wise men. Okay. And how did that happen? One of the ways to understand it and to really cut through the clutter. Uh, to give some kind of parsimony and simplicity to it is that Homo habilis, our ancestors, survived until they died out because they got what they needed to survive and they were able to defend themselves. And that's what Paul Lawrence at Harvard Business School calls the drive to acquire and the drive to defend. Homo habilis and anybody, any, any other living being need to fulfill their drive to acquire and their drive to defend in order to survive. And Homo habilis did that. We have him as our ancestor. And the brain showcases that in various ways in the limbic system, the fight to flight mechanism, etc. That's deeply ingrained in us. So we do have a drive to acquire things that we need that include status, uh, monetary wealth, and power. It includes safety, physical safety, and as we will see, also psychological safety, because those are the foundations 
around which we and our ancestors could survive. Now, clearly, we know that Australopithecus and Homo habilis died out for a number of reasons, and those reasons are rooted partly in climate change, in the change of the environment, and other conditions in which Homo habilis, with the drive to acquire and the drive to defend, was not equipped to survive. In fact, that species died out, and a very, very small band of Homo uh, survived. And hom we call them now Homo erectus. There may have been very many uh, different forms of that. But what seems to be clear from the ancient fossil records and from anthropologist studies uh, is that Homo erectus was able to bond. Homo erectus survived because they were able to collaborate. They were able to use fire and create tribes. And I will show in a moment how all of that could be connected or is connected arguably, but it seems to be, it seems to be a critical piece in our development that we became collaborative, that we as a species or our ancestors became collaborative and tribal. We were bonding. In fact, our brain developed quite a bit in that time. And all of that brain development could happen because we had fire and fire allowed us to, uh, you, to, to, to digest food outside of our stomach. Before that, we had large, very large intestines and much of our energy would go into digestion with fire and with cooking we could outsource that digestion and then all the energy that we got from the new food would be used to build out our brain. In that phase, you can see that the skull shape shifted and that there was more space for our brain, which brought along all kinds of shifts, including the shift that our babies had a larger head, which then required us or those that were surviving to create what we now call a nuclear family. So the invention that mom and dad stay together <clears throat> to nourish their child and one person hunts, the other person nourishes. Otherwise, no baby would survive and we wouldn't be here. So what Paul Lawrence says is that this is an independent drive that allowed Homo erectus to develop and survive based on top of what allowed Homo habilis to survive. So in addition of the drive to acquire and the drive to defend, there was now the drive to bond, which you can see as our fundamental sociality, as biologists would call it. We are a fundamentally social species. You look at the city as a concept, you look at Facebook, you look at social media, you look at uh, team sports, etc., and you can see what makes us social. This is sometimes something that people aren't fully present to, uh, but we are a fundamentally social species. Now, Homo erectus did not survive <clears throat> and died out, and Homo sapiens took over. Again, a very small group, uh, according to evolutionary biologists, that then were able to outcompete because the environment shifted and we had more brain power the neofrontal cortex that will, uh, would allow us to think abstractly and solve problems. Solve problems together, create tools, create more sophisticated tools, adjust to the various climates, adjust to the various other challenges that we had and create solutions to these problems in a very flexible way. So much so that we could live in the Arctic <laughs> or around the Arctic, we could live in the tropical regions and we would find a way uh, to survive there. Now, that, Paul Lawrence says, is the drive to comprehend. It is rooted in this abstract thinking in the prefrontal cortex that allows us to ask the question, why? And this drive is also considered to be the foundation of all the world religions and meaning-making systems that we needed or that Homo sapiens needed to make sense of the world understand the questions of who are we, where do we come from, 
and where are we going? You can see that drive manifest itself when people are looking for purpose and don't find it. And when they lead a meaningless life, how that will oftentimes undermine their ability to flourish or survive. So here is a four drive model that will suggest that the drive to acquire, the drive to defend, the drive to bond, and the drive to comprehend are four independent drives uh, that we all as humans have to fulfill if we want to survive. Now here is in short the story of Homo habilis on the trees and how we were actually able to survive by ourselves most times. With climate change that shifted, <clears throat> those survived that were collaborating, that could hunt the big game, the animals, and that could collaborate and that could cook and could keep fire alive and therefore have shifts and division of labor um, and create tools and function as a uh, social unit. So we didn't have the protection from the trees anymore. We would need to be outside. There was danger and we would need to connect and collaborate. Otherwise we would typically as individuals not survive. Again, the fire piece is very critical here because fire still is one of the central elements that allows us to survive. Gas, oil, the conversation about climate change is ultimately a conversation around fire and how we're able to cook food and survive in various climates. So how we handle that was critical. And Homo erectus was able to outperform other species in terms of how we would do that with central fireplaces that would be guarded so that the fire wouldn't go out. We would nourish it with uh, wood, etc., etc., and build little tribal campsites around it to guard the fire and cook the food. As I said, the skull form shifted quite a bit from our ancestors to who we are right now. The cranial capacity has grown quite a bit and therefore all kinds of other consequences emerged, including that our heads on, at birth are bigger and that uh, we are constantly questioning and that we need to have meaning making systems in our place to satisfactorily answer who we are, why we're here and where we're going. So survival chances, just to uh, repeat, are improved by fire, by having bigger prey, by having a bigger brain, by creating a nuclear family and the tribal bonding, which is manifested in the independent drive to bond. We all know games, we know religions, we know trivia quizzes, books, entertainment, movies. All of these are industries that play into the drive to comprehend us as storytelling animals to make sense of the world, to learn, to create, and to be more fundamentally human. Again, this is considered to be an independent drive because if you notice, for example, you complete a Sudoku or you complete a book or you complete a trivia quiz, there is some satisfaction that you get. The Eureka effect that you get I've got it, I make sense of the world. It, it gives you a rush. Our brain, our anatomy really gives us credit and support in figuring things out, in comprehension. So survival chances are therefore improved by abstract thinking, by the storytelling, by creating shared meaning, and by the answers to the question why. You might have heard of Simon Sinek and others right now that are talking a lot about purpose and the importance of purpose. I would suggest it is important because we are homo sapiens. And when we are looking at ourselves as uh, homo economicus who just want to maximize uh, material wealth, uh, we're missing that piece here. Meaning making is central and important and it's an independent drive. Paul Lawrence calls it the independent drive to comprehend. So what does it have to do with dignity? Well, if we know who we are, <laughs> how we have survived and what it means to be fundamentally human, I think we're going to get, we're getting at 
a notion of dignity. What does it mean to be fundamentally human? Would then mean that we are balancing the four drives. We have enough to eat. We are psychologically safe and physically safe. We have trusting relationships, social relationships with others, and we have meaning in our life, a purpose. We have an answer to the question why we are here. And when you ask people, and we have done this in various surveys, when do you feel happy? <laughs> There's oftentimes this barrier. When you have those four drives in balance, that's when people start saying they're flourishing. They feel like human beings. They don't feel like human resources or uh, an instrument somewhere, but they feel truly alive. And I'm asking, encouraging you all, like, how would you answer the question? Do you feel truly alive? Do you feel truly human? And this four drive model can point us to a couple of things where there may be something missing. Dignity as the balance of the four drives, just to go a little bit deeper, is focusing on us being more fully human and that we have what we need in order to survive. Food, sex, status, recognition, all of those things are part of being human. We need to feel good. We need to feel trusted. We need to have trust, respect, and care in our lives. We need something to make sense of the world, whether that's rooted in religion or any other sense-making system. There needs to be some higher purpose, some meaning that we can make that allows us to make sense of the world. And we need to feel safe. That's why we have the law. That's why we have police. That's why we have friends, protection, physical and psychological. And whenever that's out, we typically aren't thriving. So this perspective is building on what E.O. Wilson calls the consolidation of knowledge. This is not a novel perspective. It's just coming from a different source, which is evolutionary biology, which some would consider uh, one of the most scientific endeavors. Uh, so it is rooted in science and not just philosophy. And I would also argue that is much more scientifically grounded than the currently dominating story of who we are as Homo economicus. So Aristotle already suggested we are zoon politikon, that means social animals endowed with reason. And if you want to use the four drive theory, you can say social, that's the drive to bond, animal that comprises the drive to acquire and the drive to defend, endowed with reason, that's the drive to comprehend. So basically he suggests a four drive model here as who we are as human beings. Interestingly, uh, Darwin, said basically the same thing and said morality is a survival mechanism morality and ethics are basically the rules that guide us to be flourishing together and it's not a nice thing to have it's actually a crucial thing to have the conversation about what's good what's bad and what contributes to the common good overall this is surprising to many uh, because there is a notion of Darwin Darwinism as the most ruthless wins, which in fact is not grounded in Darwin's own work or in evolutionary evidence at all. Theology, religions, shared universal values have come across the same kind of insight. Uh, and whether you are an atheist or non-religious, a secular or uh, of any of the other religious traditions, Hans Küng suggests that there is a shared narrative, a shared consensus on universal values. He calls it the global ethic that, again, is rooted in the notion of dignity, connect with people as people, which is oftentimes the foundation of any of the religious narratives, including the Ten Commandments. So in that sense, this global ethic, the notion of dignity, is coming from many different uh, inquiries and is the foundation of what we now call human rights and what the UN network is focusing on and our understanding of us as being endowed intrinsically with value. 
So in that humanistic perspective, then, the objective is to balance the four drives rather than to maximize any of them. The flourishing happens when these independent drives are in balance, not when one of them is out or maximized. We see this in the scientific evidence of high performing teams. These teams have a short shared purpose. They have a high level of trust. They have the skills and resources that they need to achieve goals and they have psychological and physical safety present. So I would ask you to check in to the teams that you're present to where and how those drives are being satisfied. And if they are not, then you probably can put that in one or two or three of those buckets. These independent drives can be in balance around specific performance goals that are achieved, the mutual accountability mechanisms around communication, how you communicate with each other, build trust, how you create and, and keep a meaningful purpose alive. Many organizations have a purpose and a vision statement somewhere. Sometimes people would say it's on the wall, which also means that it's not really being lived and people don't necessarily feel that the meaningful purpose is part of their day-to-day -day, uh, experience. And the other piece here that we see in our research is psychological safety. When psychological safety is high, when people feel that they can express themselves without repercussion, without being fired or without being threatened, uh, or any of the other uh, uh, threats, then a team is typically high performing. When I'm no, uh, mentioning balance, I'm also pointing to imbalances that can occur. Uh, here is an image of an intern who worked so hard that he died. Uh, and you probably remember Bernie Madoff. Um, those are the kinds of people that by nature then would either be punished or not survive, sadly, because there's maximization, maximization uh, in terms of the drive to acquire and the other drives are not addressed. Same thing with the drive to bond. When you maximize the tribal aspect, oftentimes that's what happens in gangs or when you put the nation or the tribe first, that's what creates conflict and oftentimes then death. So it is not a, a workable survival strategy in the long run either. Same thing when the drive to comprehend is maximized, like here with religious zealots, crusaders or jihadists. Typically in terms of survival, they're willing to die and not survive. So from a survival perspective, it is not an optimal strategy. When the drive to defend is up, when people are protecting themselves to the degree that they maximize that, this is an image of the Unabomber, you typically also either are by yourself, you're not procreating, you're afraid, you're building up defenses, or you're land in prison, or you're, you're indeed creating a situation where you get yourself into conflict and killed. So these are some drastic images, but just to point out that this is not just a theoretical nice framework. This has real consequences. If we're imbalanced in those four drives, we typically are either not thriving or we're not surviving. And dignity is out. Teams do not work well when imbalance occurs, when people experience low psychological safety, when people do not like each other when there is no consensus on the purpose and the direction of the team, or where there's very low accountability towards performance goals. We know of a couple of organizations where those drives are in balance. Those drives are never purely in balance, but they are at large in balance. And those are organizations that typically get a good reputation in society. These are just a number of uh, businesses here. We put them up there because most people will say that in business, this is not possible. But even there, it is possible, even though it is certainly not the dominant perspective. What the dominant perspective is, is more like these investment banks, Wells Fargo, Enron, 
or any other organizations that maximizes one drive over the other. And here it's clearly the drive to acquire that took over everything else. Now it's just some closing thoughts. Dignity in that context can, is, can be seen as a foundation for human flourishing. And we are not balancing our four drives at the minimum level, then we typically do not feel fundamentally human and connected. And this has all kinds of consequences. And to close, we all use metaphors and images and experiences to understand ourselves and others. The four drive model that I'm presenting here with dignity as, as the balance is scientifically grounded and can serve as a map to navigate individual performance, group performance, organizational performance, and societal performance as well. So as leaders in your organizations or contribution, uh, or those that make contributions in your organizations, I would sub submit to you that any leader, manager, or teammate that want to increase engagement and performance or increase the well-being of oneself and others can focus on satisfying their and others people's four drives in balance. With that, I leave you and uh, looking forward to the next conversation. Thank you.